Hello everyone. So today I'm here with the wonderful Angela Kearns. Did I pronounce your surname yeah, correctly? Absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Hello, Angela. Hi, nice Hi. to see you. It's lovely to meet you. It really, really is. Obviously, this is a podcast, so you can't see Angela, you can't see me, but we have met at the Queen Elizabeth Hall yes. on the South Bank today at the first indie author conference in London. So it's wonderful. It's really lovely to meet you. So just to let you guys know, Angela is a physiotherapist and acupuncturist. She's also a woman's fiction author and her debut novel Touch is out now. And the second in the series is called Dilemma and it's coming out later this year. Angela also writes short stories and anthologies and in magazines, am I right? Yes. yes. And she also has relaxation and visualization resources downloadable and on CD. And as part of that, you can get free bereavement visualization called A Song for Ed. Yes. And it's free to download from Play Pause Unwind. Dot co dot uk. That's right. Yeah. Brilliant. So Angela lives in Essex. She's married. She's got two grown-up boys and three Gordon Setter dogs. And I guess those are the most important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the others know their, their place their in place. the pecking order. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so today I would love to talk to you, Angela, about love. Yeah. So love is such a complex and wonderful thing. So I am curious about people's beliefs and thoughts about love. And with authors, I'm particularly keen to find out what makes authors write about love. Because I know you write women's mm. fiction and short stories that all involve themes around love. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I think... I chose to write with themes of love because it underpins the whole of our lives mm -hmm. from the parental love that we receive, our extended family love, the impact that that can have on us for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. In fact, love through friendships and then love in relationships, love for children, love for our pets. So it's a fundamental part of our lives mm -hmm. and I think how we received love when we're younger sometimes impacts on how we can interact within relationships as we get older oh for sure um, it's uh, it's just imperative and I I think we can repair trauma that happens to us mm -hmm. but I think it's a slow process and I think particularly if trust has been broken within loving relationships that mm. those can be wounds that are hard to to heal right yes I agree with you and yeah. then there's loss of love as well um, so the one of the themes in my novel touch is that the the main character loses the person she believes to be her soulmate mm -hmm. and so her personal story through the book is recovery from that bereavement and learning to rebuild relationships and have trust in a future relationship. And that, that's where the story goes. It's looking at her own personal journey through, through that process. And of course, losing the person um, with bereavement, you go through different stages mm -hmm. uh, that they're not cut and dried stages. They mix in with each other. Some last for longer than, than others. They can come back certain stages. But I think the important thing for me was to get across that loving relationship that she had that she thought was perfect. Mm -hmm. Actually, when she lost him, she then had some quite deep and ugly feelings of anger and betrayal and loss as right. well as her more socially acceptable grief in that relationship so I think uh, love engenders all sorts of emotions as well so we think about romantic love but I think love engenders all sorts of different reactions and emotions so I think as you said at the start it's a really complex thing mm -hmm. yes. so I write about it because it fascinates me mm -hmm. the interaction between people fascinates me and as a as a physiotherapist I'm with people 
on a one to one basis for sort of three quarters of an hour, maybe for multiple sessions. So I'm I'm with people uh, for quite long periods of time while I'm treating them. And what I've come to realise over the years is that their physical manifestations of symptoms are very tied up with their emotions. I mean, for example, on a very simplistic level, um, tension around the neck and shoulders is, is often a manifestation of stress. It can be a manifestation of, of grief. So our body language and our posture is not just an expression of our physicality. It's mm-hmm. an expression of our emotions as well. Right. And if something's going wrong in relationships or in families, very often that can manifest itself in in the physical. Mm -hmm. So an acupuncture is a very interesting discipline because acupuncture channels within the body Mm. carry a physical pathway, but they also carry an emotional and a spiritual pathway. Right. And it's absolutely fascinating to find, when you start just maybe chatting about a physical pathway to somebody, we're going to use points here because this is where your problem is, and just lightly chatting on to say... Oh, it's quite interesting. The emotional pathway for this is the balance between, say, frustration and peace of mind. Right. And you get this immediate reaction back of, oh, well, yeah, I I am angry about this or this has really been frustrating me for so long and blah, blah. But as you treat the physicality, out come the emotions as well. Mm, So, So I think that this interaction of relationships and of the the loving relationships you have in your life are so important to your health and well-being as well yes yes I would definitely agree with that yeah yeah and I think my main character Ellie Rose initially after her grief she doesn't in fact have a good relationship or she finds her family relationships rather stifling because Mm -hmm. they're trying to protect her and and they're also trying to tell her how to think and how to react and Mm -hmm. how to be in this state they're trying to scoop her back up again almost as if she's a child but in fact the experience makes her feel more adult the the experience and she actually doesn't want it she gets away from them and But to start with, she can really only form relationships with her patients and Mm. some new friends. So she starts off as a new person with new friends and develops loving relationships with them. Right. And it's quite some time before she actually can really consider entering into a new romantic relationship. Mm. It takes her a long time. Yes. And I I think sometimes, again, with with loving relationships we imagine that they're simple and that they stay the same over time and in actual fact they don't no um they change and sometimes we can be a very good fit at a given time and then something happens our life changes in some way or we move in a different direction and we find that people who've been our loving friends or our supporting family Mm. they maybe no longer support us in that new direction or we find new people so I think it's really interesting to see how relationships develop over time and I think the other thing that I think I find really interesting is that love can be very short and very intense Mm -hmm. Or it can be very slow burn and over a long period of time and it can build up over time and one type of loving relationship, a friendship can blossom into to love or a loving relationship can turn into friendship yeah. over time. So yeah. I, I, think, I think the idea that love's a, a permanent thing, mm-hmm. it isn't true. I think it, it changes it's as, organic. as we change. It's, it develops organically. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So I think what I think is an awful the fascination of writing relationships Mm. is that you get to choose how your characters develop, (laughs) how they interact. Um, And the interesting thing for me as an author is how my characters actually take on a life of their own. Mm. And sometimes the arc that I've planned for them changes as I write the book. (laughs) So suddenly they start to intrude in different areas where I hadn't envisioned them or or they start to have uh, characteristics that I hadn't necessarily thought so the characters as I'm writing them mm. evolve and develop as well and right. sometimes end up being different to the, to the character I started off with in, yeah. in my head so I think but I think that's a fascinating thing as an author to yeah. be able to write those relationships 
And I think we draw on our own experiences of love as, yes. as we're, we're writing. And I think in some ways writing relationships can be a cathartic process oh, definitely. for ourselves yeah, too. Yeah, definitely. certainly think they can be cathartic for our readers. Mm. So I think that experiences that we've had as we express them or experiences that other people have expressed to us mm. as we write them down, they're going to chime with other people with our readers and they can be very important to them i've had several comments from people who've been recently bereaved about right. what a relief it was mm. to be able to acknowledge that they felt angry with the person who died of course and they yes. hadn't actually realized they felt angry mm. but it was sitting there underneath the surface or the sense of feeling guilty as they move mm. on yes that survivor guilt and moving on into a new life so that's that's been interesting and somebody said to me about reading about the bereavement uh, she said that she hadn't realized till she read my book and she'd lost her partner 35 40 years ago right she hadn't acknowledged to herself how lonely it had been to carry on mm. and bring up her family and without her partner right and she said Actually, your book allowed me to cry for the first time. Oh, yeah. For myself, you know, yes. for, for herself yes. um, and her loneliness. Yes. So I think it's really important mm. that as writers that we do write emotions in all their facets. Um, of course, yeah. You know, so I think that's really interesting. I do like a story that has a redemptive quality about mm -hmm. it as well. So I do like to feel that we finish on a note of hope because that's what I believe about love and loving relationships yeah. is that whatever happens and whatever experiences we have, there's always hope for the future. There's right. hope for resolution. There's hope yeah. for redemption. So for me, I like my stories to have a redemptive quality as well. And I think that that's a really good thing to do because that's what readers like. That's what we all like, isn't it? We all want yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. I do now have to go and read your book. And I think <laughs> everyone else should read it too. It sounds amazing. Thank you. I do hope they do. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about loneliness and the search for love. Because I think sometimes when people have been lonely for a long time, like this reader you mentioned, getting back into a loving relationship of any sort, but primarily with another partner possibly, is a huge step forward for most people. And it's so scary that often people don't do it yeah. at all. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, th I think a lot of people, and I think within those first relationships people have doubts as well mm. they bring with them concerns about possibly a painful ending to a previous relationship mm. or whether they can go through a loss again if yes. a loss occurs and I think that it can be extremely difficult to trust somebody again yeah and I think a lot of people go into a second relationship more slowly mm. and they possibly don't throw themselves in in the way that we do in a first relationship yes um because i think we we bring to bear our head as well as our heart heart yes and i think sometimes that can be a block to yeah a relationship but i think it can also be an important thing because a lot of the time very violently felt romantic relationships they actually change fairly quickly yeah. into other things yeah. and so I, I think it's important to recognize that a mixture of head and heart for a long-term relationship yes. is probably a very sensible is a bad word but um, <laughs> you know it's 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 possibly a good thing yeah um, it's a good thing but I think you're absolutely right some people completely isolate themselves mm. and they choose not to go there again and I think that's such a shame because I think Love is an incredibly fulfilling mm -hmm. emotion and, and a supportive, loving relationship is something to be really cherished. I don't think you necessarily have an empty life without it, but if you can have it as well, then I think it's the icing on the, on the cake. And I, I, know I am a real believer in hope 
and I don't necessarily think that in a second relationship you're looking for the same things that you are mm. in the first relationship. Sure. And I think you can have powerful, loving relationships with more than one person. Oh, definitely. Um, and they may not be at all the same person. Yeah. Because different people bring out different facets of your personality and enrich you in different ways. Exactly, yeah. And I think you touched on something really important. I think when people go into a relationship maybe for the second time and they don't throw themselves like we do when we are children into love, loving our parents or a pet or or a romantic relationship, the first relationship. It has also something to do with self-love, don't you think? Yes, I think we get better at knowing ourselves. Mm. We get better at knowing what's good for us. I think we get better also at realising that our well-being doesn't entirely depend on having a partner or another person. Yeah. That first and foremost, we need to be fulfilled in ourselves. Right. And then we have the ability to give within another relationship. And I think that, yes, first and foremost, if you, I think to f- successfully find a partner, you actually need to know yourself mm. and be and be caring of yourself right and I, I think one of the things that saddens me is to see people moving from relationship to relationship I mean it's well documented that people move from one abusive relationship to another and that's often because that is what is familiar to them mm. sometimes it's what's familiar to them from childhood right and so actually it's a sort of a comfort zone yes and I think it's really important that we do do some evaluation mm. about ourselves and our motives for seeking relationships. And I'm not saying that there's a, you know, that there's a blueprint that's right for everybody. And some codependent relationships work really well, in actual fact. Right, yeah. Um, but I think to have successful loving relationships, parenting relationships as well, you need to have a very firm sense of mm. who you are as well because any long-term relationship is going to have challenges of course yes Um, yes so you know if you firmly know who you are and what you're looking for it doesn't i'm not saying to be selfish but to have a sense of self Mm. i think is really important yeah yeah and for your partner to respect that right right if you're someone who needs space or who needs quiet or who needs reflective time it's really important mm. that that's respected within yes. a relationship or if you're someone who needs to be very active. Yeah. And I think it, what we tend to do, we sometimes do, is that in order to make the relationship work, we change who we are for a temporary right. period of time, for a honeymoon period. Yeah. Um, you know, we say that we love football or, um, oh, yeah, you know, you're really prepared to go along and stand on the touchline or, um, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, you know, I really eat healthy or I'm whatever it is. Yeah. When actually that maybe isn't who we really are. Yeah, and, and it's unsustainable. We, it's unsustainable. <laughs> so we then get into a, a relationship difficulty because that person believes that that's who you are. Right. So when they suddenly find that actually you're not prepared to go to mm. West Ham with them every weekend, <laughs> uh, oh, well, that for them was potentially part of the deal. Right. So I think it's really important yes. to have honesty about who we are yeah. in developing a relationship. And I think that's perhaps the, the thing that misses out sometimes in young relationships mm. is that we're chameleons because we're a little bit insecure. Right. We, we, we portray ourselves to be the thing that the person wants when actually maybe that's not us at all. Yes. Those are very wise words for sure. <laughs> to put into action maybe than to talk about (laughs) true true yes because as you said you know we are creatures of comfort and um, habit and we don't want to move out of our comfort zones do we really but I absolutely agree with you that we need to be authentic at all times and especially when you're young we kind of give our power away sometimes don't we to people yeah yeah Sometimes we're, we're conditioned by the environment that we've grown up with mm. to worry about what people think or to fit in with a family group right. or to take our place within a family. Mm. Sometimes places are taken within families, aren't we? So-and-so's right. the creative one, so-and-so's the sensible right. one, so-and-so's the... So 
actually when we come out of our family unit, I think sometimes we then have to find our own identity right. outside the yeah. family unit. So, Absolutely. And I think that happens when we come out of relationships yeah. as well. Yeah. I think that's why friendships change as well, because I think sometimes friendships are friendships of circumstance. Mm -hmm. And when you take yourself out of that circumstance maybe there's not enough in common yes. to sustain that relationship yes. whereas with other people you can not see them for 10 years and just pick up where you left yeah. off yeah isn't that interesting that's exactly what happens okay well that's wonderful very interesting thank you so much for spending time with us and for all the all the pearls of wisdom i hope that listeners would take on board what you've said and have a think about it because i think there's a lot of wisdom there and a lot of really thought-provoking ideas and read your book. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. So where can people find you, Angela? They can find me uh, via my website, which is angelacairnsauthor.co.uk. Mm -hmm. They can find the book on Amazon mm -hmm. and it's in Kindle Unlimited Great. Uh, and it's on ebook and paperback. And later this year, it'll be going wide out into other stores. But at the moment, it's on Amazon. Oh, that's fantastic. And where can they find, like Facebook, I'm guessing, oh, Twitter? Yes, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And there you'll find me at Angela Cairns Author. I am on Twitter as well. And you'll find me there, Angela Cairns AU. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. So I have one last question for you. Or oh, actually two. What does success look like for you as an author? Success as an author. I want my readers to enjoy the books, to live the experience, to have an emotional reaction to, to my book and to actually like it enough to want to read more or to want to engage with me so I that for me that's that's success and that's it really I want people who read it to enjoy the story and to have an emotional reaction to the story I think you can't ask for more than that if you're an author isn't it mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so my last question and I have jumped these questions on you because I hadn't thought of them before they came okay. to my mind now what would you like your legacy to be to be uh, that people thought of me as a good friend and a supportive person. So at my funeral, I would love them to be saying about me that that's what I was to them, that I was a good friend, that I was a supportive person, um, that I was invested in their lives and they were in mine. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. That was really lovely. Thank you, Angela. It's my pleasure. Bye. Bye.